In today's episode, PTEO SD story number 5, a poor retail store manager and staff is a victim of our accidentally malicious compliance. Pay me to sit and do almost nothing? Okay. When an immutable object meets an unstoppable idiot. So let's get started. PTEO SD story number 5. A poor retail store manager and staff is a victim of our accidentally malicious compliance. Another thread asked people to share stories about their PTO, parent-teacher organization, and that triggered my case of PTO stress disorder opening a Pandora's box of memories. I'm going to share a few of the more memorable stories. I've posed this in our slash malicious compliance, but there are others in our slash entitled parents. This is a story of accidental malicious compliance. For background, a PTO is an organized group of parents who support the school. In our case, we did a lot of fundraising to fund things like supplies, school band, field trips, etc. We had a president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, and committee chairs, bake sale, book sale, etc. This story takes place about 20 years ago. Budget cuts had hit our kids' school hard and the principal approached the PTO looking for help with the across-the-board cuts she was facing. As PTO treasurer, I had a couple meetings with her to review. Eventually, we found the solution. School supplies, paper, pencils, etc., were still a line item in her budget. If the PTO could take over purchase of school supplies, that would allow her to redirect that money into other areas. I was looking into bulk pricing when Salvation arrived in the mail in the form of a back-to-school sale flyer. It was from an office supply company whose name was of the method by which a thin strip of metal perforates paper and affixes them. The flyer was loaded with paper, notebooks, glue sticks and many other things, all for just 10 cents. Unfortunately there was a limit of 5 per customer. I called the store and spoke with the manager. I explained our situation and asked if we could buy more than five per customer. He was absolutely fantastic. Not only would he do it, but he'd place a special order and leave everything in their bulk boxes to make it easy for us to bring them to the school. A few of us showed up in our trucks and minivans on a Saturday. I wrote him the check and thanked him profusely. He even helped us load the stuff into our vehicles. We brought it to the school and overnight. We had a year of school supplies for just a few thousand dollars. The next year rolls around, more budget cuts, more plans for the PTO to supply almost all the school supplies. When my flyer arrived, I called and asked for the manager. The old manager had left and there was a new one. And by new, I mean literally brand new he'd only been there a couple weeks. Good news though he thought it would be okay. We hung up and I said I looked forward to meeting him on Saturday. We arrive Saturday and it turns out when the new manager informed the district manager of our plan, the DM shut it down. The DM was even there to tell me personally. Limits per customer were to be strictly enforced. Cue my plan. There was absolutely no malicious intent, but it had that impact accidentally. I sent an email blast out to all parents explaining the situation. I asked them to arrive on Saturday and Sunday between 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock. I would give them a shopping list and would have cash for them when they returned with the items and receipt. I also asked that if they had any of their own purchases to make, to ask for them to be rung up separately to make it easier for reimbursement and storage. I arrived and went inside to the new manager to explain my plan. He understood and apologized for being able to do it like we had the last year. As it turned out, lots of parents showed up, and many brought their kids. Some turned it into a scavenger hunt, so kids were running around buying packages of pencils, notebooks, and glue sticks. There were times that the front of the store was almost a flash mob filled with people filling their carts with limit 5 per customer items for 10 cents each and $5 in total sales. And because people had some of their own purchases, they were asking some things to be rung up separately. I pity those poor cashiers who were unintended victims of our plan. The lines at the register went back into the aisles and floor staff was constantly having to refill their pop displays. It was absolute bedlam. Parents exited the store where I took their bag. 
Many refused reimbursement, making this an even better deal for us, and we had a series of minivans making trips to the school to drop everything off and return for more. We would later spend two evenings sorting everything out with boxes spread across the floor of the gym. But after two days, we were nowhere near how much we would need. I went inside to speak to the poor exhausted manager, who I was certain was plotting ways to murder me with office supplies, but he was surprisingly nice. He said he'd call his district manager and plead his case. A couple days later I got a call. I could come in and pick up our bulk order, so long as we didn't unleash another flash mob of low-ticket customers. I have all the sympathy in the world for that poor manager, cashiers and floor staff. They didn't deserve the hell I accidentally unleashed upon them because of their district manager. Pay me to sit and do almost nothing? Okay. Another post about someone's experience as a temp reminded me of my own experience. So in the late 90s, I was hired as a temp for the summer at a company that provided store brand credit cards. My sister and her friend were also hired so we were able to commute together. The two of them worked in data entry, and I was assigned to help in the research department. Overall, it was a well-run place and everyone was generally friendly and nice. My boss was pretty good but she didn't really know what to do with me. My first day she sat me next to a full-time woman in the research department. Our job was when someone called the call center disputing a charge, the agent would take the information and the research department would reach out to the store to get a copy of the signed receipt. The other woman would call the stores to request they pull the signature slip, but if they were too busy to help, we would fax the request for them to fax back the signed copy. I still don't know why we couldn't just email the request, but we had to fax it. There was quite a backlog of faxes to make when I started. So I would create a request page in MS Word with what we needed, date, amount, register number, and provided a fax number for them to send it to us. However, our fax machine was awful. Remember this is the late 1990s and tech was improving but often still clunky. The fax had a memory that would hold like six pages. It would also take 2.5 minutes per page to send. The fax machine was not close to me. It was probably 50 yards away right outside the boss's window. So after the first day, I decided to print six requests, go load the six faxes to memory so they would send, and then go back to my desk and generate another batch of new requests and deal with any other tasks or emails in the 15 minutes it took for the first batch to go through. Usually when I would go back to the fax machine, we'd have a response or two from the stores that my coworker could process. After about an hour of this pattern, our boss decided I was just screwing around because I wasn't right next to the fax actively processing another fax at all times. She was very concerned about getting through this backlog as quickly as possible. I tried to explain that I was being more productive and I was using the memory function on the fax to its fullest, so there wasn't any additional productivity to be had. She wasn't buying it, so she said stop wasting time going back and forth. I want you to generate all the request pages at once, then sit next to the fax and send them all. Okay, boss. It's a waste of time, but you got it. So every day I would spend the day next to the fax machine. As soon as I saw that memory was less than 80% full, I'd queue up another fax to go. It was excruciatingly dull. Unfortunately, because the fax machine was getting no breaks other than my lunch breaks, none of the stores could send us back their signed slips unless they did it after hours. So not only was I less productive, but my coworker was also unable to do as much because we weren't getting responses since the fax line was always busy. Finally after a week I was done. But because so many stores hadn't replied, I was asked to repeat the process for all the ones who hadn't replied. Which was most of them. But since I figured out what was going on, I stopped filling up the memory on the fax and would just send a fax and then wait a minute after it was done sending before I sent again. I just pretended I was waiting for the memory to free up and the boss didn't notice. We were much more successful that week than the first. After that, we caught up and the job became much more interesting and the boss much more reasonable and good to work with. It turns out her boss had been writing her on not making more progress on dispute resolution. 
It wasn't until the end of the summer that I told her again what a waste that first week was. She was able to laugh about it then and apologized for giving me such a miserable first two weeks. When an immutable object meets an unstoppable idiot. This is from my previous employer. I was working on a tool to display and interact with the complete history of changes to certain data in one of our internal tools. Anytime a person edited said data, a new entry needed to be added which described the exact change made. This was being done mostly for internal auditing purposes, but also had to be able to completely reproduce the exact data values from scratch by basically applying all changes up to a given point to a blank data entry. This was a legal requirement for this tool in order for it to meet government auditing requirements. This effectively means that these entries could not be changed ever and were this immutable. We're nearly ready for launch. The tool works, is tested, and we're showing it to the higher UPS to get final launch approval. Now, one of the people in this meeting was a relatively new VP, who had been there just long enough now to ask stupidly dangerous questions, and who was trying to start to flex their decision-making muscles. This is where the trouble starts. The VP pipes up, so, how do you delete an entry? Me, visibly confused, uh, you can't, since. The VP interrupts, users need to be able to undo accidental changes. I'm not approving this until they can delete entries. Me, okay, but if they can delete entries we can't reproduce the data from them since you. VP, interrupting again, I don't want to hear excuses. Just get it done. Cue malicious compliance. I tell them I'll add it and quickly end the meeting. I go back to my desk and quickly implement a remove button. When clicked, this button shows a spinner for a random amount of time between 1 and 10 seconds before showing an error to the user explaining that the operation failed and that they'll need to manually make their changes to the data directly. I even included a direct link to open up the data editor for them and everything. I also added a file bug link which would indeed file a bug for the user but which automatically added both the legal department and the VP to the bug. However, for me and anyone on the dev team, this button would simply hide the entry from the display immediately, but would never actually delete anything. I scheduled another review meeting for the next day. The VP is happy, my manager is happy, all is good, and the tool gets launch approval. As people start using the tool, the VP and legal departments start getting slammed with high-priority bugs for this feature. The legal department, who were not in the approval meeting as they were located elsewhere, are furious that this feature exists and shut the tool down until it's removed and send some very strongly worded emails to the entire team, including VP that such a feature is legally dubious at best and downright defeats the purpose of this tool. I remove it within a couple hours, and everything winds up getting back on track. The best part was that I got a project completion bonus, a bonus directly from the VP for implementing the feature so quickly, before legal found out, and then a bonus from legal for removing it so quickly. Unfortunately, it seemed that VP still wanted to flex their power, as a few days later they called me and asking to add a feature allowing people to edit entries. I told VP we could absolutely do that but wanted to get approval from legal first. They did not approve. VP stopped trying to make changes after that. Thanks for watching.